Today, we have the pleasure to speak with the Honorable Eugene Rugana, who was the former Prime Minister of Curaçao and served from 2017 to 2021. In his term, Ruganath was faced with various challenges from the independence of Curaçao in 2010, as well as the difficulties brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. He was the first Prime Minister to complete his entire term since 2010, but despite that, he faced major protests during his term due to financial disparities, the financial aid at Corona, um, and corruption problems. We will look back on four years in office, the relationship between Curaçao and the Netherlands, and the major problems Curaçao faces today. I'm Rivka, this is Sofia, and please have a warm applause for Eugene Rivendaar. You are the Prime Minister of Curaçao, and when I see Curaçao, I immediately see sunny beaches, hot weather, sun, the ultimate holiday vibe. Is there a similar stereotype that Curaçao has for the Netherlands? No, uh, but actually, if you look at Amsterdam, by the way, afternoon, good afternoon. Good afternoon. And uh, welcome to the Friday afternoon graveyard ship. <laughs> But no, a lot of times we compare ourselves to, to actually Amsterdam with color. So, uh, as I mentioned in a speech I did at the United Nations, I said we add some Caribbean color to the Dutch masterpiece. So, uh, yes, we do have beaches, uh, but we are a multicultural uh, community, um, over 60 nationalities living together peacefully. Um, rich history, um, but also a forward uh, outlook uh, being part of the global economy. Um, so I do consider it as more like a city, a small city, than uh, just an island. You moved to the Netherlands to study here in Rotterdam. When you arrived here, did you have a certain image in your mind of what the Netherlands must look like? And instead of sunny beaches, rainy days, bitter water? Well, um, I was very accustomed and I love Betterballen. Uh, so actually, even though I grew up in Curaçao, we are more Dutch, I think, than we uh, dare to admit. Uh, what I didn't, uh, wasn't used to, of course, I've lived in, in London before, so I was used to, uh, let's say, the seasonal changes. But uh, predicting the weather before you leave uh, your uh, Student Akama uh, was quite challenging. I never knew which code to pick, uh, but I went to Rotterdam School of Management, which was very international, as I, as I see here. Uh, we had like 35 nationalities uh, in, in one class. So I felt very much at home, uh, being someone that grew up again in a multicultural uh, community. I worked in the international financial services with uh, a lot of international colleagues. So yes, I felt uh, very much at home in Rotterdam. Only thing at that time, Rotterdam closes down at 5 p.m. So everybody leaves. There was a few clubs, uh, half of them I couldn't get into. So um, yes, I watched a lot of TV. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as you mentioned, uh, the Netherlands and Curaçao have quite a complicated history. Yes. Could you briefly explain the current status of Curaçao's independence? Well, the current status, uh, we actually take a small step back. Uh, we were a colony, of course. Uh, we switched hands uh, throughout history, first Spanish, then Dutch, and then English, and then Dutch again. Uh, and then, I think in the year 1954, uh, the Netherlands and Tilly's, which at that time were six islands, so it's uh, Aruba, Curaçao, uh, Bonaire, St. Martin, Seba, uh, and Station, uh, attained their autonomous status. At that time, if you can recall, uh, a lot of colonies won, were seeking their independence. Uh, for example, Indonesia, which was part of the kingdom, became independent. Uh, we chose to remain part of the kingdom, but we wanted our own government. And at that time, uh, so the Netherlands and Tilly's, as it was known, uh, attained their autonomous uh, status. But throughout the time, Aruba stepped out at 1984. Uh, but there was a growing 
demand that each island wanted to go their own direction. So 2010, uh, Curacao became uh, autonomous within the kingdom. Strange, uh, which means that the kingdom is consisting right now of four countries, Aruba, Curacao, San Marco, and the Netherlands. On paper equal, but we do know it's not equal. Um, if I explain it to my uh, fellow uh, Caribbean nations, uh, as they see it, we've got the best of both worlds. We are part of something bigger, but we have our own government. The relation is quite complex. Of course, it goes back in history uh, with being a colony, also uh, slavery as part of the history. Um, but in practice, it's like, you know, uh, having a parent that you like taking care of you, but you don't want them to tell you anything. <laughs> Basically, that sums up how the relationship with Holland is in practice. Um, and can you feel this presence of the Netherlands in Curaçao today? Well, very much so, because if you, again, look at our constitution, uh, for example, defense is a task that is done mainly by the Netherlands, but as kingdom. So we do have a military base, we have a coast guard that we work together. Um, also, uh, for example, as prime minister, um, I was in charge of, I actually represent the country. Uh, so foreign relations, uh, certainly in the region, uh, was part of my portfolio and I had to work with the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And from a development point of view, um, a lot with uh, the Ministry of uh, Midlands and Sakhon, so uh, internal affairs and, foreign and uh, kingdom relations. So a lot of back and forth, and we do have a governor, which has two hats. She represents the king, Willem Alexander, but is also the head of government. Actually, she's my boss in a way. So yes, you feel Netherlands, but also tourism. We have the familiar ties, we have a lot of tourism coming to Curaçao, tourists from the Netherlands, uh, businesses that are established there, so you do feel the presence. And for me, that is what makes Curaçao a little bit unique because we are Caribbean, we are very Dutch, we are also so Dutch European, uh, but also Latin, and that makes us actually uh, unique in a way in the Caribbean, but also uh, enables us to connect very much of easier uh, with a neighboring country to, to give one example. Would you say that uh, Aruba and St. Martin also face like a similar relation and connection? Similar but different. Okay. Um, St. Martin is, is very different and very unique as well because it's a small island with a French side and a Dutch side. Uh, but also uh, because if it's, uh, it's part of the Windward Islands, uh, more in the Caribbean, more to the northeast, it's more, let's say, British than Dutch. They speak English. Uh, or they speak English, you know. Aruba, um, through its history, because of the refinery and the, the, the focus on American tourism, is very much U.S. oriented, which as you compare to Curacao, uh, we do have our U.S. influence, but a lot more European oriented compared to, to, to Aruba. And we tend to be competitors as well. So it's a friendly foe relationship we have with, with the world. You're still financially dependent sometimes on the Netherlands. You receive a lot of government aid, a lot of help. Seeing the history of Curaçao and the Netherlands and your fight for independence, do you sometimes feel like your economic dependency interferes with your political independency? Very much so. Um, it's part of the reality. I can share with you, uh, my, my counterpart for the Dutch government was uh, former uh, State Secretary Simon Knops. And you once said something that, that you know, it didn't feel right at the moment uh, because it was in the middle of the COVID pandemic. Um, we lost all tax revenues, uh, tourism was down, the refinery was shut down also because our difficult relationship with Venezuela at this moment, they closed the border. So we basically had no income uh, and although our finances 
from a debt perspective was, was stable. We had a, a good quota about a, a debt uh, to, to GDP ratio of about 60%, which is high, but not problematic. Um, we had to lend money. Uh, we had to borrow money from the Netherlands, which came with uh, conditions. And at that moment, uh, and yeah, we had to borrow money to, to, to keep our people safe, uh, to keep businesses, or let's say maintain employment. So it's not to do luxury things, it's survival. And he said, you know, you guys are not able to carry your own autonomy. Or, or even you don't deserve it. That's how I heard it. When he came to Pyrrhus, I said, well, what is this beep you are saying to us, right? But he said, well, in reality, how autonomous are you really? And even two days ago, we spoke about this. I said, you know, you were right. Because we are not able to sustain ourselves financially and economically yet. On the other hand, that's one. So I said, as our ambition, you want to be responsible because autonomy comes with responsibility, our own responsibility. You want to become financially and economically independent from Holland, also to become a stronger partner within the kingdom, the four countries. On the other hand, if you look at themes like quality of education, the social, uh, the sustainable development goals, so quality of education, infrastructure, uh, energy, food security, cyber security, there is no one little island that can handle all that on its own. So the question then becomes, how autonomous do you want to be? And to put it a little bit more bluntly, in an interview a few days ago, I said, you know, what is the worth, the value of autonomy if your people remain poor? and are hungry. That's why we are seeking, in any case, I was and my party uh, was seeking a new relationship with Holland where we do share responsibilities for some of these basic services like education and healthcare and infrastructure. It must be a difficult line to walk though, where you really want to have your own independence, be fully autonomous, and then at the same time, the people you're working with and whose help you really need telling you that you maybe aren't as autonomous. Do you sometimes feel like your personal emotions in these kinds of conversations hamper well, the discussions? Well, not mine, because uh, I had a pretty good idea where I wanted to, to go. Uh, I compare it to sailing. Is there any sailors in the, in the room? Like, There's one. <laughs> a sailboat cannot go straight, right? You have to tap back and forth, left and right. But if you don't know where you want to go, you will end up in a different direction. So I knew where I wanted to go. I wanted to become stronger. I wanted the country to reach its full potential, talent-wise, economic-wise, cultural, um, and also become a more valuable partner within the kingdom. And for that, I wanted to work with Holland. And here and there, even depending on how you phrase it, some politicians, they say, oh, you are giving back your autonomy. I say no. I'm, in, I'm autonomous in my decision making to, for example, say, okay, in my vision, I want education to be at the same comparable quality throughout the kingdom, whether you're in Bonaire, Curacao, or Amsterdam. And for that, we need to be able to do this together. Or if you take hosp hospital care or health care, if you put it in the pool and you work together, you can have a, sustain a better quality. And that is the growth path I, I was on. But coming back to that parent you don't want to tell you, it is an emotional relation. Uh, we do have some hurt, I think, a lot of our people from the past. You do also have um, uh, politicians that manipulate, that no how to play those strings of the, the internal hurt that still lives. Uh, and so each time I say, okay, I'm going to Holland, I had a good meeting with Mr. Rutte, and we're going to do this. Oh yeah, you're dancing to their flute again. And I had to manage that emotion in the discussion. And that's why my proposal was, okay, Holland, 
kingdom because we have two other partners. Let's work on a development program. Let's bring in the World Bank. Let's bring in the IMF. Let's make it quantifiable so that people see, okay, if we go that path, that is how I'm better off as a student or as a parent or as a public employee and citizen to take out a little bit of the emotion because the emotion plays a role. To use one final example, the language. We speak Dutch in Curacao, of course, uh, but our Dutch and the words we use tend to arrive differently. Um, to give an example, at one point I was very angry with Holland and Mr. Knops and Luther and what I said. Because we had a financing came with conditions, right? And at one time these were hard conditions. So uh, in June 2020, they had a list of conditions uh, and some of them we already took. For example, reducing uh, the salaries of the ministers out of solidarity. But Holland said, okay, all public ent employees have to reduce the salaries or benefits 12 and a half percent. You know, that's a tough one because all employees includes teachers, includes people that are working in healthcare. Holland said, no, unconditional or no money. That's how it went. That's how it went down. So at one point, Holland was saying, when the protest came, you mentioned, yeah, but we didn't ask them to economize of bezuinigen, the Dutch word. And I was like, how can they be lying? Here it is, cut 12.5% to this. And, and then a colleague of mine, who was ex-advisor of uh, previous prime ministers of Holland, he said, well, well, in The Hague, when we use the word reform, it means economize. <laughs> so actually, if your Dutch counterpart uses the word reform, that's what I mean. And so, yeah, sometimes you need a translator, even though we both speak Dutch, how Dutch is felt in some words is different on both sides of the ocean. What can be sort of felt is maybe this love-hate relationship, right? Between Curaçao and the Netherlands? Yeah, well, I don't like the word hate. Um, it does cause irritation. Uh, we do have different view of things. For example, you know, there's a difference in context. Even though we're part of a kingdom, what works in the hate or Amsterdam doesn't always work in Curacao. Uh, for example, if Holland says, well, you don't have daadkracht, uh, how do you call it? Uh, let's say boldness and drive for execution. And I'm like, what do you mean I don't have that? I'm doing this with a small bunch of people I have with no money, you know, and that's where the emotions and the uh, but I consider the relationship as a relationship in development still. And that's where I put my effort when I became Prime Minister. It was like meeting a family from afar. You know your family, but you haven't actually spoken to each other for 20 years. In our case, maybe 10 years. So I had to invest again in the relationship and in a low trust environment, on both sides because of the emotions and the history and the false promises on both sides because Holland sees says, okay, you're saying the right things but I don't see you doing the things. And we say, okay, you promise to help but you don't help and then we go. So it is very important for the current government and those of the, 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 the future to keep building on that foundation of trust, and then you can make things happen. In the last four years, there have been major changes in the world. We had a lot of problems in different countries. What was the main challenge you encountered in your time as Prime Minister? <laughs> um, it was a lot, and so I cannot summarize it in one, uh, to just give a few, a flavor of how it was, because, and, and one of them is expectations, by the way. I remember now a quote that Kofi Annan said about Barack Obama when he came. Uh, and everybody was excited around the world about Barack, 
President Obama, sorry, President Obama. And he said, well, he has a lot of problems to deal with and the expectations might be too high. So when I became Prime Minister, even in the Dutch newspapers, they were calling me John F. Kennedy of Curacao and those things. No, I don't know what that means. I was not putting someone on the moon, but there was high expectation. But my first day in office started with crisis. We had an oil spill coming, so I had to enact the crisis team. Then we had Venezuela with problems, they closed the border, uh, the refinery shut down, migrants coming, problem with the public finance, and a relationship with Holland that was difficult, and the COVID pandemic. So actually, I remember one student was asking me, um, Prime Minister, do you ever have time to think? And I was astonished. Wow, what a question. And the answer was no. So I was not able to build anything. And the other problem that made it a little bit worse because we had a lot of opposition. So I had the unions uh, wanted to block everything in the country, paralyze everything. Uh, we had a small rebellion, if I can call it that, in June 2020. Um, but social media, and maybe that's something you can discuss in other sessions, the impact of social media and the fake news and the 24 sensation news cycle on government. Really, it's everything is real time, so you cannot manage and govern and inform and communicate and implement. No, everything is happening, and most of the news going out there is not based on reality. So the ability to communicate in that environment, giving the right information and reaching the voter, for me has been a challenge. I can give one example. At one point I asked my candidate to meet on Saturday because we had this report from the SER, Social Economic Council, about uh, the minimum wage. And I said, you know, this was a live, thick, uh, thick report. We need to dedicate one cabinet meeting about this alone. So we're discussing it, SER giving presentation, and then all the phones were going, so what's happening? The government fell, the government fell. Outside, a reporter was standing, yes, there is a crisis meeting inside. The government just fell, we have this based on uh, uh, actual uh, inside knowledge. And I'm like, what's going on? We're just working here. So the space to work and build and discuss and look at data, we had to manage everything on the side. And coming back to the expectations then after four years, and that is something that I still carry with me. I did the best I can and I, I still sleep well at night, but I don't have the feeling that the country is better because of my work after, five, after four years. Because it was managing crisis from beginning to, to end until the last moment. So crisis was the biggest challenge. Just keeping up with everything, ensuring that you can go from one crisis to another. Keeping up uh, and the communication. I remember people telling me, yo, and we see you in your suit and tie and uh, you're like in a role. Uh, you're like a robot. <laughs> I'm not a robot, but yes, it is a role. And you have to be the calm person in the room and you have to give directions and you have to take the, 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 the difficult uh, decisions. I mean, one of the most difficult, I mean, you all had it already, uh, you know, uh, let's say taking away your liberties during the COVID pandemic. But even I, for example, I had to go to a lockdown with the second wave, the Delta wave, uh, end of 2020. And those of you that know the island a little bit, Christmas and New Year's is party time, right? It's party time, round the clock. New Year's is fireworks uh, and with a lot of, um, let's say, happy making beverages. So when I implemented a curfew, 9 p.m., after two days, me, myself, said, I said, I'm keeping people in their houses during Christmas and New Year's, 9 p.m.? That's crazy, but it's something we had to do. Unfortunately, 
uh, it went without any problems and most people understood at that point that, that we had to do it. But when you have to make the decisions, not everybody can understand why you, why you do it. Yeah, but on, for instance, a more, I guess, not so peaceful note, in 2020, when the pandemic came, obviously a lot of challenges came from that. But one thing we did see were a lot of mass protests. People were protesting against low wages because tourism is a big sector, right? And there was no tourism. People, I guess, were really reliant on food packages where up to 50% were waiting for food aid. Um, and yet they were still not happy with how the government was addressing this issue. And the fact that the government, for instance, still had high pays, whereas people weren't able to receive that income. How did your government deal with that? Or well, first of all, um, being transparent, I almost have press conferences every day. Um, being, showing empathy, and that's why I said, even before Holland asked us to do something about uh, salaries of the members of parliament and ministers, we already took the decision that, at that time we took the decision to, to let's say, decrease them and the difference would go to the food bank. Uh, so that it goes back to the, those who need it most. Um, but the protests, we, well, some of the protests were already there, and we can get back into that because we had some unions that were even, I think, financed by external parties or even countries. But the 12 and a half, and to give you one example, uh, in the campaign I, I met a teacher, and she was explaining to me that they don't earn a lot. I think in Curacao, the teachers earn least in any part of the kingdom at this moment. Uh, she and her husband use their own money to buy things for the classroom and for the students. And then we came with a 12 and a half cut. And she told me, I was very angry at you. I'm angry. Now, some politicians, because June 2020, we have, you know, Basically, a group started manifesting, they came to the fort, they started breaking things down and, and setting fires. Uh, so it was a real challenging situation. It was fueled by the salary cuts, which extended to, to everybody, uh, government employees and employees of semi-government institutions and government-owned companies, everybody. And, and they were very angry, and they were supported by some opposition parties. So it was a mix of, of people that are angry for the right reasons and being used for the wrong reasons. So I had to manage that. Um, but the salaries, let's say of the higher placed public uh, personnel and certainly the government-owned companies, that was a real issue even before the COVID. Um, here we have the, the, I don't know if we still have it, the Balkan and the Norm? We still have it. Yeah, so we wanted, since I was Commissioner of Finance, that was year 2004, because there was a, you know, going back, what happened in the 90s, there was, I think in Netherlands as well, we were spinning off government services or privatizing uh, so some went to become foundations, others become government and base uh, corporations. But what happened was, sure, you took them off your public budget, you don't have a public expense anymore, but they could became an expense for the community in the sense that the salaries went really off the charts. And I'm not exaggerating, uh, before they did studies that, okay, they have to earn a uh, mark conform, so, so market standard wages, uh, and they employed large consultants to, to make the salary, but then they even increased. And some of these, most of these institutions are monopolies, so they don't, for example, a utility company or a, a communication, telephone company, they don't have competition, or they didn't have that. And you provide a government service. So for us, you cannot justify those, uh, let's say, salaries that at the end cost the community that you serve. So we wanted to come from, with a bottom end of the from that time. There was already a law made 
before, I think that was in 2016, there was a law already based on the Balkan and the norm. This law then we updated, we included the 12.5% and it went to Parliament, but now it's on hold because, uh, because of the conditions of Holland. Aruba had to come with a similar law in St. Martin and uh, let's say in the discussion, Holland want, wanted us to come with a uniform legislation for all three countries. So this is still in the pipeline and I uh, agree with it. I agree with it, it has to be transparent, it has to be justified and it is a public service. If you want to work somewhere else and earn higher, go somewhere else. Uh, and it's based on, we used the Balkan and the norm, so it's, it's a um, ceiling based on the Prime Minister salary, <coughs> which is a decent salary, but it's not off the charts. I can uh, attest to that. So hopefully, once this legislation is passed, no more mass protests, because people are angry. No, I think um, one discussion will be the 12 and a half, um, because when I was informed of this by Prime Minister Rutte in May 2020, I said, this. Out of solidarity, yes, we need to cut down the expenses. We need to lower the salaries, and we need to look at the higher scale wages to see if they are justifiable or not. But do know, if we come with a cookie cutter all across the board, 12 and a half, it will income people that are not earning that much. It will impact people that are close to minimum wage, it will impact people that are working in the first line, in public health, in the middle of a, a, a pandemic. And that's where the anger came, the teacher I mentioned. And so what happened afterwards when we reached the accord, Holland together with the government did like a study, okay, let's study how these salaries are developing, what functions are tied to these salaries so we can do a more systematic, data-driven um, reform than the cookie cutter, oh no, not cookie cutter, what are you calling it? Cascaf. The Cascaf. cheese... Uh, cheese cutter. Anyway, cheese cutter. All across the board. Uh, so I hope uh, in the legislation, maybe they will have something like that, where the lower uh, earning people are not impacted the same as those that are earning higher wages. Before running from crisis to crisis, you actually ran a very strong anti-corruption campaign yes. before your 2017 elections. Why did you place that issue so high in your political agenda? Well, actually, I'm uh, the party that I, I'm part of uh, has good governance and integrity as, let's say, our banner, right? And for me, when I was in the Island Council uh, as of 2003, I actually did a lot of reading about the relation between corruption and poverty. And there is a direct relation between corruption and poverty. Even so, for example, if someone living in a, in a country uh, which, which is plagued by corruption, they step on a plane, they land, in a country where there is rule, rule, rule of law, good governance, governing principles, there they flourish. Nothing happened on the plane. It's the conditions that, that change. So I was passionate about, about that already. Uh, and actually, uh, we were very far along with coming with a integrity bureau, which would independently be able to receive um, let's say, uh, complaints from, for example, stakeholders and, and government employees, and they could investigate it and make sure either administrative uh, corrections are made or they alert, uh, for example, the public pro prosecutor to take um, actions there. The law is done. All we needed was funding to start the project, but in my experience, I also had one incident because you need to walk the talk and you have to make, uh, let's say, uh, structural 
uh, change with an institution like the Integrity Bureau uh, to make sure that you deal with the corruption, but also awareness because most important is if the values and the principles of integrity are internalized in the people. That is the, is the, is the front line, let's say. Um, but I had an incident under me, there was this big uh, public bid, let me call it that, for an operator of a refinery going on. With very clear rules, it was an international bid. And then I got information that one of the parties and some people involved, employees of the public company, were doing a parallel track. So I took what I could do, I informed uh, the supervisory board, instructed them to take action, but I also went to the public prosecutor and they were prosecuted. So uh, it was not nice, it, it affected our reputation, it affected, uh, let's say, one of the, the, the parties we were negotiating with that, that stepped out. Uh, but when it is in front of you, you have to deal with it as well. And that is coming from the importance I place on integrity and also on the other side, the effect that corruption has on the mentality and the well-being of the people. Another development is uh, the COHO, an entity the Dutch government placed upon receiving long-term development fund of almost 700 million. Yeah. Um, this entity should make sure that the funds that you get from the Dutch government are used effectively, are not lost to corruption. What do you think of this idea of having this special semi-Dutch, semi also Gersavian yeah. Well, I agree with it. I agreed with it. Uh, it started off wrong in the sense that, again, we are in the middle of a crisis. The whole world was still learning how do we deal with this pandemic. We were doing it with good support of Holland. Let me put that up front. Uh, medical equipment, uh, protective equipment, staff vaccines, we got for free, okay? So that's the relationships again of that mother you don't like her telling you what to do, but they, they do help you. Uh, on the other hand, there were large, of, large sums of money that were being financed at that moment. And Holland correctly said, you know, the bank would do the same. Okay, I'm helping you, but this cannot go on forever and you need to implement reforms. And they were looking for a way to Make sure that happens, right? So they came with this law, which uh, was called uh, Caribbean Reform Entity, something like that. But it's C H E, and in Papiamento, it says Che. And Che is something that's nasty, right? <laughs> in our local language. Okay, so the whole Che became a joke, but the process was incorrect. Because the fact that we wanted a long-term, intensive cooperation with Holland. Yes, we need assistance financially, but also expertise through an entity. Yes, it should be embedded in what we call a Koninkrijkswet, a Rijkswet, a kingdom law, which uh, has to be approved by, by all countries. Not all political parties were that eager to have another kingdom law. We were okay with this, I was okay with it. Uh, and with support of my party, I, I drove it to the end and we got a new deal. The process was incorrect, why? Uh, based on our constitution and statute, we, statute, we also call it a consensus rights well. A kingdom law based on consensus in the making of the law and then in the implementation of the law. What happened was, and again, the context, middle of the crisis, Holland dropped us a package, and you remember the exact date, it was July 6th, that we have to approve unconditionally on July 10th in the Kingdom Council of Ministers. A package we still have to read, it's a consensus law, which in no way agrees with the principle of consensus. So we said we cannot. And in the law there were some issues we had to look at that could be infringing on that autonomy. 
and not the emotional autonomy. The autonomy, for example, that this entity could decide on how government funding is spent, which is actually the constitutional uh, task of the parliament. So you're infringing on our parliamentarian democracy. And any law, we need to ask for our advice, our own advice, advice or council advice, uh, comparable to the kingdom uh, as to advice on the law before we, we, we agree with it. So we said we cannot do this. But because, again, the sailboat, I knew where I wanted to go. I knew that I wanted a good cooperation with Holland for our own benefit, based on our own vision. I said, I do want that kingdom law. And why is it important? It's not only the entity that can facilitate funding, access to, for example, EU funds, access to expertise, which we don't have, because we don't have the execution capacity to implement so many reforms at the same time in an accelerated pace. We don't. So I saw those benefits. And because of that, I came here uh, on a flight, I booked it in the, the morning, I packed and went to office, got on the plane, came to the Council of Ministers, rejected it, but I said, I want to sit at the table. And I kept asking to come to the table, and in the beginning, Holland said, is this or nothing? I said, no, I want consensus. And when uh, we had a good conversation at one point, Knopf says, okay, you can make the changes you want, we will look at it, and then I said, what happens to those changes which you don't agree with, that are fundamental for us, for example, from our constitutional, parliamentary, anyway, uh, parliamentary or, or let's say, uh, uh, autonomy point of view, because I have to be able to sell it to my parliament. He said, those points that you don't agree with, you can send it to our Rafenstaten, which is a kingdom entity, to advise on it. I said, okay then, then we can do it. So then we took the Here step. <laughs> yes. uh, so we agreed with the law of, in concept that went to the Rafenstaten. We agreed on the, what's called the country package of reforms, which is based 85% on our own input. Uh, and that started in execution right away. That was November 2nd. 2020, it's still in execution. The law is now being discussed in Parliament, so hopefully uh, it will become law. And the final important thing of that whole thing, the reform package of this magnitude takes more than four years. It takes eight years, even maybe 16 years. So it has to survive changes of government. And that's why Holland wanted it embedded in a kingdom law. And for that reason, I agreed with it. Because I knew we would need this consistent policy uh, and this consistent long-term collaboration to implement these uh, important uh, reforms. Because reforms is not a discussion. Even if you, I mean, even the opposing politicians say, okay, I don't agree with this law, but I know that we have to implement these reforms. The sad things, and I will be very honest with you guys, as Prime Minister, I knew one thing. I needed any, anybody that cook, you know slow cooking, pressure cooker? I needed a pressure cooker with the help of Holland with this law. Otherwise, those reforms, I mean, labor reforms, we were talking about this 20 plus years. I had no indications that miraculously we would implement it on our own now. So I wanted to have that pressure cooker so we can make that nice pot of stew that will become the curacao with a sustainable uh, good uh, life. Yeah, um, it's understandable that a lot of issues, especially issues with financial management, they take long to implement, they take time, and they take a lot of minor changes to actually make something big out of it. Yeah. But what about um, some more pressing issues? For instance, aside from, from corruption, you also had to deal with the Venezuelan refugees, which yeah. you had previously mentioned. And there were a lot of reports that had released some human rights violations yeah. 
from the Curacao end. So why, how did this happen? What can you say on it? Oh, how did this happen? Well, you know, the, the situation in Venezuela, we know it's a domestic situation. Uh, you have there an undemocratic sitting government. Uh, the social situation, the health situation, economic was for lack of a more diplomatic word, a disaster. Uh, so you had mass migration, millions of people. Uh, I don't know what the numbers are now, but they were going the direction of uh, uh, four, even five million people leaving Venezuela. Uh, at one point in Curacao, more or less 10% of our total population was Venezuelan undocumented persons. So they were coming on boats. So part of them, when the border was open, uh, was coming on plane and overstayed, then became undocumented. But then they were coming in the, and you can imagine, in the middle of the night, in a small boat, waves, and the Coast Guard may be shooting on you or not. It's a very dangerous, and we have boats that sank, people that, 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 that you know, are no longer here. Um, and then the discussion is, okay, what do you do with those people? We didn't have the capacity, first of all. Um, on the good side, if they're ill, they do receive care. And there's a foundation that helps them, but the hospital uh, has an obligation to, to provide health care. The children that come, there were not many children, they do receive education. But undocumented persons have to be processed because most of them come to work, but some of them may be people you don't want in your country, that have a criminal background, are part of the gangs, and this is real. There are gangs of Venezuela in Curacao. So you need to keep them temporarily in, in holding, so you process, and, and that's what we call uh, the temporary holding. We call it the barracks, right? It was not conform, you know, uh, uh, let's say human rights. So in that case, we talked to Holland, and Holland gave us funding to make it a more pleasant facility. Uh, so some of the things in the reports are true. Some were being dealt with, and some were, let's say, not fact-checked in the sense that they interview some of the human rights groups, and of course, they tend to tell the story that helps their cause, which might be based on the truth, but it's not entirely the truth. But human rights is an issue, that's why I went to Parliament, I said, in my view, safeguarding human rights in the kingdom has to be a kingdom matter. We all are responsible at countries, but Holland, and that is the relationship, not into the mother again, Holland has more execution power and expertise to help us with this. And we need to find a way to collaborate. Going back with the migration situation, what, what did I do then? I saw that these people are in our community. Most of them are working illegally, but they're hidden. We don't know how many people, we don't know how many women, uh, in what conditions they're, they're, they're living. And these vulnerable group of people tend to be abused. What do I mean by that? For example, the people that are working for are not treating them correctly, or uh, their landlord, they're paying rent, they're not providing that, they're not complying to the contract. They don't go to the police because they're afraid to go to the police. Or they lose their jobs, and they tend then to be vulnerable, to either be abused of, or uh, maybe even some of them become criminals or do more illegal, illegal practices, let me put it more softly. And the fact is, these people are working, they're not uh, medically insured, they don't pay taxes, so they're not contributing. So what I wanted to do, and I talked to Colombia, I talked to Trinidad, which went ahead to have a temporary legal status for the Venezuelan people coming in. As part as a vision of managed migration because we can use productive people and many of them are educated. They're doctors, they're nurses, they're engineers, architects. So I wanted 
a way to have them as temporary legal staff so their human rights are honored and also uh, maybe eventually as part of a new vision for migration they become part of our community. Then I come back to Holland. Holland has another view or some of my colleagues in Holland. Because if they become part of our community, they get a legal status, they live long enough in Curacao, basically they can apply for a Dutch passport and they become Dutch. And then they can step on a plane and come to Holland. And that is something Holland doesn't really want. So then the policy was uh, basically scare them off. Don't let them enter the country, uh, you know, send them back. And that caused a lot of the, 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 the questions that were raised from a human rights perspective, that we are sending back people that are leaving the countries because of the conditions. And that is sometimes where our visions are not alive. But the way I did it was um, I went to work with international organizations like the IOM, International Organization for Migration, and the UNHCR, which deals with refugees, who helped me come with the correct uh, policy. And we didn't have the, the whole policy, but what we did was um, my Minister of Justice came with a trick because conform to a law, you cannot apply for a work permit if you're already in the country. You have to be outside the country, the employer then asks for a permit, you get a permit, then you can come in. He used a trick, he said, well, the border is closed, we have COVID, there's no flight, so these people cannot be out of the country. So, temporarily, we will allow them to either renew their permit or apply for a permit. And that's a small step we did within, again, the sailing boat, within that vision of coming to a mass migration or a managed migration for Venezuelan people in Yeah, you mentioned also working with different organizations, but then how come Amnesty International was initially rejected to do their reports? Uh, Amnesty International, uh, I do respect them. They do amazing work all over the world. But they are also an advocate. So if, if that's your point of origin, you want things in your report. And then you just need to add, talk to the right people, and then you get that input, and you make that report. That's why I'm saying part of the things in the report are true. Part of them might be a little bit, like say, not exaggerated, but out of context. Um, and that's why, uh, you know, as government, we need to get an opportunity to react and respond on a report like that before it's published. And not, it doesn't happen every time. Uh, but uh, again, uh, I don't want to, I mean, like, I don't want to criticize the report and, and uh, let's say, creating the impression that we are disregarding the human rights issue of the thing. That is, should be a fundamental principle of the thinking, and we do have a responsibility also to uphold and safeguard human rights. But you know, a small country with large unemployment, managing a crisis, uh, decaying uh, infrastructure or old infrastructure, schools that are not up to par, to be able to take in 10, 20 percent. Uh, people uh, from Venezuela, handling that alone, it's, it's, it's almost impossible. So uh, we have to put things sometimes in the right context and, and deal with it. Um, finally, just a little note on this, would you have done something different? Because the human rights issues were recurring and they lasted for a few years, since 2018 and up to 2020, the most recent report. Would you have maybe approach or implemented something differently at the time to have prevented the issue more wrap quickly? Um, I think I would move quicker to taking steps to recognizing that these people are coming to our country, most of them temporarily, and instead of sending them back, Instead of putting them in temporary holding, 
move faster to uh, temporary uh, legal status, uh, with or without the consent of all. So before we go to our final question, let's open up the floor for some audience questions, if there are any. I see a girl in a red shirt with her hands up. Uh, hello, thank you very much for the interview. Um, I had a question about a topic which hasn't been really been discussed yet, the climate crisis. And because Curaçao is still so closely affiliated, affiliated to the Netherlands, which is one of the main causes for the climate crisis, but still is one of the countries in the global south, uh, so mostly affected by it. Um, I just wanted to hear your view on that and like what ex experiences you had in the past, like when negotiating with the Netherlands about climate adaptation, etc. Just uh, interesting. Yeah, actually, that's one of the themes that we are working closely with uh, the Netherlands, but also um, you know international uh, NGOs. Uh, we did a lot of work with regards to protecting biodiversity uh, underwater. Uh, for example, we have now a legally protected underwater park. Uh, we took the decision to uh, come with an underwater sanctuary that's about 30% of our total, let's say, uh, let's say water economic zone, the EEZ. Um, we came with fish breeding zones. So we did a lot of research together with these institutions. Uh, there is a alliance within the kingdom to protect biodiversity and I just saw that um, last week or so they enacted a, a climate change task force which was actually starting with the decision we took uh, to work on, on the overall uh, let's say climate change uh, challenge and also um, what we have to do more is the biodiversity on land there, together with the uh, scientific uh, institutions called Karmabi, we are, um, let's say, expanding the protected natural parks. And we have the big polluter, uh, which is the refinery, which is a complicated one, uh, because the refinery at that moment, when I became prime minister, represented more than 10% of our GDP, a large employer of high-skilled workers. Um, so the intention of previous government and our government was to find a way to continue with the refinery but impose uh, stricter uh, environmental uh, regulations, which uh, together with Royal Haskoning, a kingdom, let's say, institution, that is done, the policy is done, the law is, is done, ready to go to parliament, uh, and the party we were negotiating with had a five-year grace period to invest and comply with the regulation. However, that is not the future. We cannot have a refinery and a big polluter on the island uh, for the future. So together with TNO uh, and local and Dutch companies, we started this thing we call the, the living lab of the new horizon, where uh, we would work on solutions for the energy transition to come with more renewable energy. Uh, but with also renewable energy, I think we're among the best in the kingdom, believe it or not, uh, with regard to wind. Um, I think we are now at 40% uh, sustainable or renewable energy, uh, and still we haven't done a lot with, with solar. Uh, we have some projects with deep sea water cooling. Uh, so there's a lot going on uh, with regards to uh, energy transition by some diversity, but still I know it's, it's, it's just the first steps. Uh, and the Sustainable Development Goals, the Agenda 2030, we included it in our National Development Plan. Um, and also I installed a national uh, committee, which is public-private, to work on the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. So, in that respect, we're working well with, uh, with, the, with the Dutch government, but also regional, regional partners. We have time for one short second audience question for the girl in front. Um, hello, Bontardi. It's a pleasure to meet you again. Um, I would like to ask you a question about your stance on the dollarization 
because um, the Central Bank of Curaçao and St. Martin uh, did say that there's, they are conducting a study on uh, whether the island economy should adopt a dollar as a legal tender. So I was wondering, what is your stance, and do you think, um, like, on what side are you more, like, uh, whether it's a cost or it's a benefit for Curaçao? Thank you. Uh, good one. Um, let me start by this. Uh, the investigation that is being done is part of our agreement that we have with, with the Netherlands, so with the Minister of Finance, uh, Wapka Hoopstra, we agreed that we wanted to do this assessment. Um, I saw the report of the Central Bank, and I do agree with the Central Bank and the IMF on one part. The dollarization will not be the solution for our economy. So we should not think that going to the dollar will be a solution for everything. Uh, I do think, uh, and we did this before 2010, 2010 uh, I lean towards dollarization. And I'm saying that without uh, going in the, in the specific, uh, let's say, the scientific part of the, the research. Uh, I don't think it has to be a priority right now uh, because it won't help solve all our issues. But the reason I lean towards dollarization is because if you look at our trading partner, um, even the best, so the Dutch islands of Bonaire and so on, switch to the dollar, St. Martin is already a dollar-based economy, Aruba the same. So, you know, what is the benefit really of having your own currency? The central bank will tell you, well, we have more space to have our own monetary policy. Which might be true, but if your currency is pegged to the dollar, how much space do you really have? Uh, on the other hand, I do think there are efficiencies that you attain with going to the dollar uh, and, and lower costs. It does mean that uh, every time you, you uh, let's say you don't have to exchange money and pay the license fee and the transaction fee at the bank. So some people tend to lose some income uh, and I think it will be simpler for us being that we are already a small open uh, economy. But again, I'm saying I'm leaning towards that without having uh, going in depth in the, the pros and cons of the, the issue. Then it is time for the last question of this interview. If you are allowed to dream big, realistic but big, in 15 years, what is your ideal scenario for Carousel? I can tell you what my ideal result is. Very simple. Carousel, one of the best places to live in the world. And it's so simple, why? Because with the policies you implement, with the work you do as a government and the economy, at the end of the day, it has to impact people's life. So anything you do has to be tied to how does it improve living in Curacao. And the good thing is, it can be measured. If you check out OECD, they have, I don't know what it's called actually, but they do assess and they select, they rank the best places to live in the world. I think right now it might be Norway. It used to be Australia for many years. But if you go to that, you will see how come they rank these countries. And it has to do with uh, work-life balance, um, public housing, education, healthcare, different areas of public policy where you can actually influence positively and measure how it can improve people's lives. And I mean, uh, I used to be part of, I don't know if you know the JCI organization, but we used to have a creed where uh, one of the phrases says, and I finalize with that because that's what I carry in my heart uh, up until today, service to humanity is the best work of life. So in that way you will be serving life. Well, I think that's a beautiful note to end this interview on. I want to thank you all for coming. Next week, we have Paul Collier and Gunnar Wiegens, two extremely interesting interviews. So please all come watch. And for now, thank you very much for being here. And applause for the team.